Hello all, Jeff Warshaw here again. Uh, I told you I was going to do a film about some somewhat obscure uh, 1970s dystopian science fiction movies. Um, first, a little background. Um, up until Star Wars, uh, which was, of course, 1977, Close Encounters, and E.T., um, a lot of science fiction films in the 1970s had a very dark tone. Uh, this reflected something of the um, social situation at the time with the Vietnam War going on, the Cold War, uh, worries about overpopulation and smog and, you know, pollution and destruction of the environment um, and uh, things like, you know, global disasters. Um, and these all filtered down into movies like, um, you know, Soiling Green, which is mostly about overcrowding and uh, poverty and... Uh, Rollerball, which uh, in which a violent sport uh, takes over people's uh, lives, basically, uh, and the whole world is run by these giant mega corporations. Uh, gee, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? And um, uh, things like uh, the Omega Man, which is about a you know deadly plague that wipes out humanity and leaves only these bizarre mutants uh, in their place, and the Last Man is trying to survive. Um, so these kind of uh, themes and, you know, elements made their way into a lot of the science fiction of that time until, uh, you know, Star Wars kind of shined a, a bit of a brighter light and E.T. and Close Encounters also um, influenced the genre and it started changing direction, though not entirely because, of course, the last major significant science fiction film of the 70s was 1979's Alien, which is you can't get much darker than that. Um, so let's talk about some of these. These are more obscure films, which, you know, hopefully you either haven't heard of or you might want to know a little bit more about. And, you know, maybe after I mention them, you'll go out and watch them. I'm pretty sure they're all available on streaming, uh, probably for free. Uh, most of them are available on Tubi, uh, which is a free service. Um, the first one, and when I mention who directed this, you're, you're going to probably jump out of your seat because it's none other than George Lucas. Um, but this is not Star Wars, this is not American Graffiti, this is before all of those. Uh, his evolved from his student film at UC, um, University of California, um, called, which was called THX 11384EB, which he did in 1967. A uh, very different version, which is, you know, had very minimal special effects, etc. But the theatrical release was just called THX 1138 which is the name of the principal character. It was uh, made in 1971. It's rather short. It's only 88 minutes, which is, you know, just a little bit more than an hour. Uh, again, as mentioned, directed by George Lucas, written by George Lucas and Walter Murch. Um, stars Robert Duvall, Donald Pleasance, Maggie McComey, and Ian Wolfe. And um, the music was by Lalo Schifrin, who you may know from as the man who composed the Mission Impossible theme uh, and lots of other movie themes, too and TV themes. Um, it takes place in a dystopian underground city where people are basically drugged to the point of being in a kind of a perpetual stupor. Uh, they work, but they don't really have any uh, pleasures or any identities. Society has become so consumer balanced that they actually buy products um, and put them into a consumer, which destroys them. So they're basically spending all their money on junk and then destroying it intentionally. Um, so that's a, you know, kind of a comment on consumer society as a whole. Uh, the principal character, um, THX 1138, played by Robert Duvall, uh, has for some reason stopped taking the drugs that he's supposed to take and he's starting to kind of realize, hey, you know, this is kind of a sucky reality that we live in. Uh, he's arrested for, um, he has a roommate who is Maggie McComey, whose uh, name is LUH3417. And um, they're having sex, which is okay, but you're not supposed to fall in love, apparently. You're not supposed to have any emotions in this society. Uh, it's okay to have sex. It's not okay to fall in love, and he's starting to fall in love with her. So he's arrested by these chrome robots, which are the police force, and uh, put into this jail, which is basically just a big blank white space there are a couple of other older people in there, and they're a little bit insane. Ian, Ian Wolfe is one of them. Uh, you may recognize him as Mr. Atos on Star Trek, um, and a, yeah, a lot of other roles, too. A great actor. Uh, British. And uh, there's also, you know, there's some, you know, there's kind of a parody of religion, because when they have problems, they go to a 
a machine which shows an image of a face that's sort of like Jesus, and it's called OMM, A-O-M-M, 0000. And it gives them this bland sort of canned speech, no matter what they say. Um, and uh, it's uh, eventually um, THX, with the help of another uh, prisoner called SRT, uh, escapes, and he's trying to escape the city, but the chrome rob robots are after him. Um, he, one of his, his friend, SRT, crashes and is killed when he tries to steal a car. Um, THX figures out how to drive his car, and he gets out, and he starts climbing up a um, ventilation shaft, which seems to leave outside the city. And the chrome robots warn him, don't go out there, you know, it's radioactive, you, you won't survive, you know, don't leave the city, and, you know, come back now. This is your last warning. Well, he ignores them. He goes out and, you know, he walks into a beautiful setting sun. So there's kind of a positive ending. Uh, there are references to this movie in almost all of Lucas's other works. In, for instance, in American Graffiti, John Milner's car's license number is THX-138. In Star Wars, uh, there's a voiceover which says, THX-1138, you're not at your post. Uh, and there are various other references in almost all of the other Lucas films. I think uh, there's a plane that has the same numbers in uh, Indiana Jones. Um, the next movie is one of the strangest things I've ever seen, called Idaho Transference from 1973. And it's directed by Peter Fonda, oddly enough, and written by a guy named Thomas Mathiason, uh, distributed by Pando Company. Stars, uh, and these people are all kind of unfamiliar to me, Kelly Bohannon, I'd seen her in something before, but I don't know what, uh, Kevin Hurst, Dale Hawkins, and surprisingly, Keith Carradine. Um, it's about a uh, girl who's taken to a mental facility, and uh, she's having some sort of problems, and um, it turns out that uh, they've invented some sort of time travel device. And they send her up into the future. In the future, there's been some kind of environmental disaster that's basically wiped out civilization. And they're looking for traces that maybe civilization is coming back. They're studying snake populations. They're studying, uh, you know, plants. And they're trying to figure out, you know, how to... And these are all young people who are sent because old people can't make it uh, through this process. And even the young people, uh, if they're sent too many times, their, their kidneys hemorrhage and they die. Uh, so they can only send them a couple of times. And uh, they're trying to survive in this very strange uh, environment. Uh, at one point, one of the females says, you know, I think I'm pregnant. And the uh, guy says to her, to Keith Carradine, says, don't you understand? You're not pregnant. We're all sterile, you know, because of this radiation uh, that exists in this future world of, uh, I think it's the year 2044. Uh, and the end is very dark. Um, a The last survivor, who I think is Kelly Bohannon, is... Uh, placed into a car by these sort of futuristic beings and humans in silver suits, and they're going to use her as fuel for the car. And the little, a little girl asks, well, what happens when we run out of people, Mommy? And she says, well, then we'll have to start using each other, won't we? And that's a really, you know, that's one of the darkest things I've ever seen. Very strange. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's good. It's just, you know, very chilling. Uh, next from 1973, this is a, another bizarre movie that you probably haven't heard of. Uh, Possibly for good reason. It's not really great, but it's still interesting. It's the final program, which is also referred to uh, in the U.S. as the last days of man on Earth. Uh, from 1973, directed by Robert Fust, written by Robert Fust and Michael Moorcock from his Jerry Cornelius uh, book of the same title. Um, it's uh, released by New World Pictures. Uh, didn't do very well at the box office. Um, it stars John Finch, Jenny Runnaker, uh, Hugh Griffith, and Patrick McGee. And it tells the story of uh, Jerry Cornelius. Is, it starts out at his father's funeral, which is in Lapland for some reason. And uh, his father has uh, this microfilm that is apparently very valuable, but it's being held by his somewhat evil brother, Frank, at his house in London. So he goes back to his house and he meets with his old retainer and he tells him that Frank has uh, poisoned his sister, Catherine, and there's a little bit of an odd incest thing there between uh, Jerry and Catherine, which I think is meant to be a reflection of the relationship between Elric and Cymoral in uh, the uh, Elric stories. Um, but uh, he's drugged her into a sleep, and he's hidden the microfilm, and he's not going to give it to him. And they have to assault this house, which has all these weird psychotronic defenses, makes them all disoriented. And there's a, like a killer chessboard and some bizarre special effects. Um, and in a 
battle sequence, which again is reminiscent of uh, and reflected of Elric. Uh, Frank hides uh, behind Catherine and uh, as they're having a fight with these needle guns and uh, Jerry shoots at Frank, but he actually kills Catherine by mistake. Um, that's reflective of what happens with Elric and Soimoro when he's trying to defeat Yerkun with Stormbringer and he accidentally, Yerkun shoves uh, Soimoro onto Stormbringer and she's killed too. Um, then they, uh, you know, Frank escapes with the microfilm. So now Jerry has to chase him, you know, basically across all the continents. There's a little kind of a weird thing with this Indian shaman who tells him that the, tells Jerry that the final days of Earth are coming and, you know, people need to prepare for the end of the world. Jerry kind of ignores him and, you know, he goes out in search of Frank. A friend of his gives him an, uh, a uh, F-4 Phantom jet, which he flies to somewhere, I think it's in India, and uh, he finally meets Frank there, and they have a confrontation, and uh, he kills him with his needle gun, and finally gets a hold of the microtape. Meanwhile, there's a woman named Miss Brunner, uh, played by the very beautiful Jenny Runnaker, who wants the microfilm as well, for some kind of scientific group that she's a member of. And uh, she uh, effectively uh, persuades Jerry to come with her. Uh, they go to this weird facility where there's an old German U-boat, and uh, this very strange machine that uh, uses the sun's power to mutate things. And uh, they also have the brains of like five of the greatest scientists in the world. That they're going to filter through this computer and they're going to create this quote unquote perfect human being. And uh, the perfect human being is supposed to be a uh, mix between uh, Ms. Brunner and this kind of hunky guy. But instead they're going to replace that guy with, with Jerry. And uh, in the end he's transformed into and in the book it's supposed to be transformed into a combination of himself and Miss Brunner. But in the movie, it turns out he's like an ape creature. And I don't know why they did that. Uh, one of the critics, and this is funny, and Brian Searle said it was an unmitigated disaster and you should demand your money back even if you watch it on TV. <laughs> I think that's great. Apparently Moorcock hated it too. It's the only one of his novels that's ever been made into a film, unfortunately. Um, next we move up to 1975 and A Boy and His Dog. Uh, those of you who are fans of Harlan Ellison will know that this is basically his only, um, one of his only short stories to make it into a movie. It was directed by L.Q. Jones. It's 91 Minutes, produced by L.Q. J.A.F. Productions. Uh, and it stars Don Johnson, Suzanne Benton, Alvy Moore, and Jason Robards, who's hilarious and really good. Um, it's a post-apocalyptic tale of this boy named Vic, and he has a telepathic dog named Blood, who helps him both survive by finding food in these burned out, you know, post-apocalyptic cities, and also by finding women uh, for uh, Vic to have sex with. And one day they're at a, a movie theater, which is run by a, a gang, and they're seeing these, you know, horrible movies, and um, Blood senses a woman in the theater. And he tells, you know, Vic, there's a girl in here. And he says, oh, you're crazy. Nobody, you know, girl would come here. And he says, no, she's dressed as a rover and she's over there. And so they pursue this woman. And unfortunately, she goes down to, to a place that's populated by mutants called Screamers. And uh, he says, oh, no, you know, you shouldn't go down there, Vic. You know, you'll get killed. Well, Vic is, you know, lustful and he goes after her and, you know, he seduces her. And uh, then a gang comes and they want to, you know, kill them and you know, kill Vic and Blood and take the girl. And Blood is saying, you know, come on, let's get out of here. You know, it's a trap. Well, Vic won't have any of it. And he starts, you know, defending the girl and, you know, he just defeats the gang. Uh, he has Blood make a noise that sounds like one of these quote unquote burn pit screamers. And he waves a green cloth around and shines a flashlight into it and scares the heck out of the gang people. And they run away. He follows uh, Suzanne Benton to this, um, uh, drop shaft, which leads to an underground city known as Topeka, where uh, there are these people living in this sort of odd, you know, utopian society where uh, everybody complies with the rules of this bunch of people called, older people called the committee. And if you don't, they have a robot who breaks your neck <laughs> and uh, they call it being sent to the farm. And uh, what they want Don Johnson, what they want Vic for is uh, they need, quote-unquote, you know, fresh blood to impregnate their women, but it's not what he thinks. He's not going to, you know, get to have sex with these women. They strap him down to a table, and they're extracting his sperm, and then they're going to kill him uh, when they're done. Um, he escapes. 
with Suzanne Betton, uh, destroys the robot and gets he manages to get back to the surface. And uh, it turns out that Blood has been in a terrible fight with the Doberman who almost killed him. And he hasn't had anything to eat for a while. And I won't spoil the ending for you, but there's a very shocking ending, which is not the ending in the... Uh, well, actually, it is the ending in the short story. But uh, for some reason, uh, Jones changed the last line. And I really don't like that. I know Ellison didn't like it either. I talked to him about it, and uh, he told me he didn't like he didn't like a lot of the, the sort of misogynistic lines that uh, Jones had put into the movie, and he begged him to take them out, but he wouldn't change that one. Uh, anyway, worth watching and uh, recommend it. Last one is from 1977. This is not a movie. It's a television program, but it's weird. It's dystopian. It's interesting. It was called Alternative 3, and it was from Anglia TV, and it's a quote-unquote mockumentary. Uh, it stars Tim Britton, Gregory Monroe, Carol Hazel, Shane Rimmer, and Richard Marner, and it was written by Christopher Miles, and the music is by Brian Eno from uh, King Crimson and uh, Frippin Eno, and from, who also played with David Bowie, a uh, very excellent musician. Um, it, it's presented as a real episode of an actual real TV program called Science Report, and they're talking about the quote-unquote brain drain from Britain, uh, which is that top people in all fields, mostly science and mathematics, seem to be disappearing without any trace, and uh, they don't know what's going on. There's also something about the mysterious death in a car crash of a Professor Ballantyne, who um, worked at Jodrell Bank, the uh, British radio astronomy um, array. And before he dies, uh, this Professor Ballantyne had sent a videotape to a friend of his in the press. But when his friend played it, there was only static on the tape, so he doesn't understand you know, why he sent it to him and you know, what's going on. Uh, it follows this, uh, there's an interview with a, uh, you know, fake scientist who tells him that, you know, the world is having all these disasters, heat waves and droughts and floods, and that they're looking, the scientists have been looking since about 1957 at some sort of, you know, alternatives to, you know, how is mankind going to survive these, these coming uh, disasters. And one of them, uh, called Alternative 3, is apparently a program to send uh, humans to the moon and or Mars uh, to populate those planets and get them ready for colonization. Um, they meet with, uh, the interviewers uh, meet with a fake astronaut played by Shane Rimmer, who's called Bob Groden. He says that uh, on a mission to the moon, he discovered something he wasn't supposed to see, and he put it on the um, medical channel and you know, refers to it as something as Juliet. Uh, which was a beginning of a lunar base, I guess, that they were building. Um, he won't talk about it a lot, and he sits there and kind of wastes the interviewer's time for a long time, and finally he says, you know, if you want to decode that tape from Professor Ballantyne, you need something called a jukebox. You need to go get uh, the jukebox. Well, that doesn't really tell much to the uh, interviewers. They go back and interview one of the girlfriends of one of these people, scientists who's disappeared just recently, and she gives him a circuit and says, this will turn your tape player into a quote-unquote jukebox. You know, you know what I mean? And then, you know, she's feeling very threatened and she disappears too. They uh, play the uh, tape again with the jukebox and it shows uh, purportedly a US, joint U.S.-Soviet robotic space lander uh, in 1957 landing on Mars and they see life. They see some, something moving under the surface. And they say, yeah, we're here, we're on Mars, we have life. Um, this was done as a, uh, a gag and uh, as a clue. It was released on April 1st, 1973. So it's an April Fool's joke. But a lot of people thought it was real. People called into the program. Because it was presented as an actual uh, episode of Science Report, and because they used the actual uh, announcer for Science Report on it, uh, just like Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast, people thought it was real. And there are some people, apparently, who still think it's real. Um, anyway, those are five interesting um, dystopian, you know, lesser-known dystopian science fiction movies of the 1970s, and I hope you enjoy them.